Hello, everybody, and welcome to my devotion today. I'm going to start off with just the end of Christ, the life of all the living. Love me to comfort in my anguish. Thousand, thousand thanks shall be. Dearest Jesus, on. I pray that today is a blessed time for you as you are joining me today for this devotion. And we'll take a uh, section here from Philippians, uh, which is one of our readings for the season of Lent. And I think as we reflect upon the suffering of Jesus, this portion will make sense. So let me share that with you right now. And we'll bring that up nice and big, see if we can do that. All right, hopefully that's coming through. And let me see if I can get this out of the way as best as possible. Paul says, have in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this in mind, rather, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Who, though he was in the form of, in the servant, in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Certainly a wonderful passage. A couple of things that we want to keep in mind there. Um, it, talking about servanthood, this issue of servanthood. And of course, we think sometimes, well, hey, I'm a servant. I'm a servant. But let's take a moment uh, to be humble a little bit about that issue and understand the difference. We never want to equate our servanthood with that of Jesus Christ. And let me give you a couple of examples to illustrate that. Let's say that it's Christmas time and I want to go out and get a gift for my spouse or my children or uh, a parent or a friend or so forth. Now, I may think to myself, wow, I'm really doing a good thing, right? And perhaps you are, but take a minute to introspect and, and gather together some of your other motives. For example, if I don't get my wife a gift, she will be upset, and I don't want her to be upset. If I don't get my parents a gift, I will feel bad about myself, and I want to avoid that. Or if I don't get my friend a gift, then I can't expect to get a gift from them. And so we recognize, and there are plenty, plenty of uh, other examples of we look at servanthood and we say, well, my motives are mixed, or let's say that I'm going to work. Sure, yeah, I'm a servant for my boss when I go there, but what's the underlying reason? If I wasn't getting paid, if I didn't have to make a living, would I be at my job today? Just another example of how we compare our servanthood to that of Jesus Christ. We look at Jesus Christ and we see very clearly that his servanthood is supreme. And why is that? Remember that Jesus is God in addition to be a human being. So he loves us and he wants us to be with him in heaven, but he is perfect and he is joyful and complete even without people in heaven. And so we think, why is it that Jesus came to die for us? Was it because he was lonely? Was it because he felt he had to? Or was it simply pure servanthood? that in his amazing love, he took on human form and he came and he was a servant for us. And how did he do that? Of course, we know he came and showed us perfect servanthood. We see it in washing the feet of the disciples. We see it in his healing and in his care for others with making food, so on and so forth. But most clearly in his death on the cross, that there Jesus humbles himself fully in charge. Let's never go and start thinking that the soldiers had power over Jesus. He chose it. One of the neat things that I've read recently is, is we think about this. Jesus is God. That means that he gave life to the soldier that was pounding the nail into his hand. 
He also made the tree grow from which the cross was made for his crucifixion. In other words, it's God who is making this happen all the time, and Jesus is completely in control. Now, finally, uh, so we don't get too long, this issue of every knee will bow, every knee will confess that Christ is Lord. All right, now, this is how it's going to happen. Jesus will come back, and everyone, there will be one distinction, those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and those who don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, or those who have rejected Jesus Christ, including the devil and all of his angels. So think of a football game, all right? You want your team to win. You definitely want to win, but your team doesn't win. And so at the end of the game, you have to recognize that one team won. In other words, the people who won, they don't have any problem confessing that they won the game, right? The people who know Christ don't have any hesitation to say, yep, I'm a Christian, and I'm glad that Jesus is here, and I'm ready to go to heaven. But even those who don't know Jesus Christ, those like the opposite team, who even with sadness and grief have to admit that the other team won, they have to admit it nonetheless. And so that means that the devil, his angels, and all those who don't know Jesus Christ, even though they will not spend eternity in hell, even if they hate Jesus Christ, they will bow to him and they will confess that he is Lord. And so that's a reason for us to go out and share the good news. It's also a reason for us to live in joy even today as we deal with the Corona-19 virus. We recognize that we are saved, that we are forgiven, that we are ready for heaven, regardless of what this world throws at us, including this very troubling time. I pray that this has been a blessing to you and that you live in the grace and joy of Jesus Christ. Blessings on your day today.